Welcome. If you haven't found a seat, I'm going to invite you to come in and find one and join us uh, for our Sunday morning service. My name is Pastor Brandon. I'm the Next Gen Pastor here, if we haven't met. Um, and if we haven't, I look forward to meeting you at some point. Um, but this morning, we're just going to start off uh, with a couple of announcements. So if you are looking to um, support the church financially or give uh, tithes and offerings to the Lord, there are three ways that you can do that. First is by cash or check, just in the brown box between the doors back there. Next is out in the foyer. You can give with a debit card or a credit card. There's a POS machine over there. And finally, you can uh, donate or tithe online. Um, we also have, if you're new here and we haven't met, we have Connect cards in the, uh, in the lobby at the Connect desk. If you want to grab one of those and fill them out, uh, a pastor will get in touch with you. Uh, we want to get you connected. We want to have you involved at church. So if you want to get involved that way, please feel free to fill out a Connect card. Also, if you have children, it would be awesome if you would sign them in to the nursery or to downstairs uh, prior to sending them down there. That would be super great um, and just super awesome. If you have kids uh, from age newborn to like four or five years old, they can go to the nursery. We have the nursery open all service long. Uh, we have somebody in there to look after your kids and take care of them. So if you want to send them there, feel free to do that. Also, today, it's Halloween, which means today is our fall carnival. If you notice, there's a giant balloon arch back there. Um, there's going to be a bouncy castle in here afterward. It's going to be absolutely awesome. Like, it's going to be so exciting. Um, so if you have kids, if you have grandkids, if you have neighbor kids, come back at 2 o'clock today. It's going to be super sweet. We're going to have candy, games. It's going to be awesome. So awesome. Um, and... Uh, Shirley has an announcement about uh, Operation Christmas Child. Yes? yes? Yes. Perfect. So, big round of applause for Shirley. <laughs> Welcome up. Thank you. Good morning. <laughs> so, I'm talking about the shoe boxes this morning. Um, Originally, we were going to have to have them back next week, the 7th of November, but the delivery situation has changed, so we actually have another week. So November 14th is when the boxes need to be back, and you can bring them up to the stairs here. And um, Bethel's actually going to be the pickup spot for Lady Smith now. That's part of the changes. Yeah, yeah. So. I think you realize that when the children receive their boxes, and most of the boxes from Canada go to Central America, Haiti, and Western African countries, children are so excited. They don't always get them at our Christmas time, but these are children who don't have much, and they're really excited. And they know that this is a tangible gift that God is actually gifting them. And after they receive the gifts, there's teams of Christian people who give the kids like a 12-week Sunday school um, course. And it's from a booklet, The Greatest Journey. And um, you can read about that in the, um, online. Um, so also realize that it's not just the child that gets this fun box of goodies, but their family and their communities also benefit from being part of the Samaritan's Purse organization that uh, arranges all the boxes. For about 10 years, I don't really remember how many years, the Bethel people have been very supportive of making up these boxes. And uh, many do it by shopping locally, but you can also do it online. Just go to Samaritan's Purse and look for the shoebox um, title and how to pack a shoebox, and you pay for it online as well. I really appreciate that the cost of filling the boxes is becoming more challenging each year. And perhaps if you can think of this as a family effort for missionary offerings, 
these boxes going to places that none of us or not many of us are going to get to to help children that may help also do you know that you can get a tax receipt um, the envelope where you put your money that helps um, cover the cost of sending these boxes to children there's this red little bit um, and that tells you about the um, tax benefit this last year, uh, no, actually just this week, I learned of another place in Nanaimo off Bowen Road called Gifts for Kids. And this store was actually started to be an economical place to buy gifts for shoe boxes. Uh, so if you want more information, um, just see me at the back after. I can give you the address and such. Uh, also to add a personal touch to your box, we have these pages. They're great for kids, uh, but adults can do it too, just to tell a bit about ourselves. Or if you want to write a letter, uh, that kind of thing is okay as well. Remember to put the age and gender of your child and tape that on the box, and um, to put the $10 inside the box. Um, So if you're all ready to bring your box in next week, that's fine. That encourages everybody else to do that. It's amazing to me to think that 9.1 million shoe boxes were handed out last year. You know, when you think of COVID and all that was going on, that many boxes were sent out to that many children. So just to send our boxes off with prayer, let us pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we pray that these boxes will be filled with love and that the way will not be impeded for them to go where they're meant to go, Lord. Lord, prepare the children and soften their hearts. Be with all those who are involved. Provide goods and healing and safety and peace to everyone who's involved with the boxes. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Um, if you're able, you can stand with us as we sing some songs.
promises never fail. Your promises never fail. Your promises never fail. Your promises never fail. Thank you, God. Promises never fail.
God, we're so thankful for um, being able to meet this morning. Uh, God, I just pray that you would continue to keep working through this service, Lord. We're so thankful for what you've done already. Um, God, I pray that people who couldn't make it this morning, Lord, just be with them there as well. Um, yeah, we're so thankful for you. In your name, amen. You can be seated. Well, good morning, everybody. Kids, it is that time. You guys can head off to your uh, Bethel kids downstairs. You guys are going to have a blast down there. Man, who's excited for the, the carnival a little later today? Look at that balloon arch. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? <clears throat> there we go. See if I can still preach after singing. <clears throat> I'm one of those people, uh, hey, I just want to I just want to let you know, you know, if you're if you're in church and you're like, man, I don't know if I should sing or not. I don't have a good voice. That's OK. And neither do I. I uh, do what's called making a joyful noise to the Lord. Um, I don't you know, the joyful part is uh, is, you know, it's up to interpretation. It might sound like someone's stepping on a cat's tail, but in the heart, the Lord looks at the heart, right? Right on. You know, I want to talk for a moment about the scariest moment of my life. I'm dead serious. I've had a lot of scary moments in my life. I'm a little bit of an adrenaline junkie. I, I uh, do cliff jumping. Uh, one day I want to go skydiving and it hasn't happened yet. Um, I've been in a car accident. I've had a few moments in my life that were a little bit scary. Uh, but nothing, um, none of those things come even close to comparing to the story I want to tell you this morning. It all started when uh, my kids and I, with some family friends, and we're, we're going for a walk uh, down, down the, the trail by the Penticton Channel. Okay, so if you're, if you're unfamiliar with Penticton, there's uh, a lake on this side and a lake on that side, and there's a channel that runs in between the two, and there's a wonderful path there. And we were walking. Caleb was about three at the time, and he had one of those strider bikes, you know, where you just push on the ground and propel yourself. And if you know anything about my son Caleb, you know he just lives his life at full speed. He lives his life at Mach 1. And as you can imagine, he was always just a little bit further ahead of me than I thought was, was comfortable, okay? Uh, but that's okay. He was, he was doing his thing. Loveland, um, I was pushing her in the stroller. She was still just a little jelly bean in there. And we were going for a walk. And uh, we got to this point, we got up to the bridge, and I had Caleb wait for me, and, and there's this point in the trail where you walk across the bridge, and then you, you have to go underneath the bridge to continue walking on the other side of the river. And so, you know, we're going across this busy bridge with cars, and I've got, you know, Caleb's hand uh, in a death grip as he starts, you know, aimlessly wandering towards traffic, right? Typical three-year-old stuff. And we're, and we're walking over, and we get to the other side of the, the bridge, and I put his bike down, and I, I set him on it, and, and he, you know, races off does his thing. And then he got to the point where there's this little hill, right, where you're going to go under. You're going to go under the bridge, and there's this hill, and it, it faces down towards the river, and it curves around. And he's sitting there, and he's paused, and he's looking. And I'm coming up behind him, and I'm like, how's this going to play out? And he decides to go. And I just watch in horror as he goes down that little hill, and then instead of making the turn at the bottom, he went straight through over the bank, headlong into the river, and starts to sink. Well, right away, I, I was pushing Loveland. I ran down the bank. I, I set the stroller kind of to the side. I jumped into the water. Thankfully for me, the water was only about, you know, this deep on me. I jump into the water, and I grab Caleb and, and pull him up from underneath the water, and he's, he's crying. And then all of a sudden, I hear, look out, and I turn around, and coming right towards my head is the stroller. <laughs> It's barreling down, and I managed to get out of the way, and it hits the water, and, and Loveland's buckled in, of course, and so the weight of the stroller drags her down, and she goes underneath the water, and so I've got Caleb in this arm, and I'm trying to lift the stroller up, because I can't unbuckle her with one arm, and I'm kind of, you know, standing in the water like this, and finally our family friend comes over, and I, I hand her, you know, Caleb, and then unbuckle Loveland, and, 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 and hand them Loveland. The kids are both crying and, and weeping, and, uh, you know, my adrenaline is at an all-time high here. 
And I managed to grab the stroller, I grab the, the, the bike, I bring it out of the water, and thankfully the only casualties uh, of that walk were my pride uh, and my iPhone. Those were the only two things that we lost that day. But just that moment, that moment where I thought this might be the moment where I lose one or both of my kids was by far the scariest moment of my entire life. And that moment is what I want you to, to grab onto. Because just the possibility of losing my kids was too much to bear. And it's precisely that bond between a father and a child that makes today's passage so compelling. It's like a train wreck that you just you can't look away. You just need to know what's going to happen next. This morning as we draw um, part two of our, our Gospel According to Genesis series to a close... Abraham faces the greatest crisis in his life, the death of his son. See, Abraham up to this point has endured six different man-made crises that have threatened the promise of God. Right, a, a quick little recap, God promised uh, Abraham that he was going to make him a nation, that he was going to have a son, that he would have land, that the entire world would be blessed through him. And this entire story of, of Abraham, the entire story of his life is waiting for the promise of God to be fulfilled, waiting for the moment where at least he has a son. And there's different man-made crises um, that, that stop him at every turn. There's a famine in Canaan, right? We talked about that. And Abraham went down to Egypt with his wife. And out of fear, he lies to Pharaoh and says, hey, this is my sister. And um, he almost loses his wife. He almost loses his ability to have a child that way. When Lot separates himself from Abraham, Lot was his, his, his nephew. He, he could have become a son by adoption or something like that. He could have, you know, done some, some legal gymnastics. And, and maybe Lot could have been the son of the promise. But Lot separated himself as well. There was that small matter of the Middle Eastern War uh, that we read about. Right? There's the Ishmael drama where, where Sarah decided to take things into her own, her own hands and, and gives um, Abraham hit her slave to have a, have a child. Then there, we see that there's the birth of, of Israel's enemies, uh, Moab and Ammon, through Lot, and, and that made the future of Israel uncertain. Abraham makes the same mistake again, in, uh, this time with Abimelech, that he made in Egypt, where he lies and he almost loses his wife in order to save his own skin. And interspersed in these, these six different crises, God affirms at every corner, Six different times that he will do what he promised. But none of these are anything compared to Abraham's seventh crisis. See, in the first six crises, it was human initiative that created these problems. This time, it's God's initiative that creates the crisis. And we're going to be taking a look at Genesis chapter 22. Before we get there, though, I kind of have to let you know what happens in chapter 21. This crisis kind of catches us a little bit off guard, um, because after the chaos of last week's sermon, chapter 21 really reads like a happily ever after kind of thing. The, the chapter opens, it says, And God kept his word and did for Sarah exactly what he had promised. And that's Bible speak for happily ever after. And Sarah has the son of the promise, right? After all of these years of waiting and waiting and waiting, finally she has a son and she names him Isaac. And you can see the, the irony and the sense of humor there is both her and Abraham laughed um, when God told them that they were going to have a child at an old age. And so she names him Isaac, which means laughter. And there's this sweet sense of, of relief and joy that at long last God has fulfilled his promise, and we get these, these loose ends are kind of tidied up. We see with Hagar and Ishmael that God provides a place for them to go. We see um, Abraham and Abimelech where things were a little bit tense there. They make peace together. And Abraham can finally breathe for a second. And then that rest is immediately disrupted when we get to the next chapter. And this is what it says. Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. 
The next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddles his donkey and took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for the fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told his servants. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there, and then we will come right back. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders, while he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them walked on together, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. We have the fire and the wood, the boy said, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son, Abraham answered. And they both walked on together. When they arrived at the place where God had told them to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on top of the altar. And Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know that you will truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. Then Abraham took up, looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in a thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. Abraham named the place Yahweh Yara, which means the Lord will provide. What a story. You know, it's hard for us as, as modern 21st century readers to grapple with this passage. You know, it offends everything that we know about God. It offends everything that we know about a father and a son relationship. And so we have to ask ourselves, you know, what kind of God would demand such a horrific and unimaginable thing? What kind of father would go through with it? And what kind of son would be willing to endure such suffering? So let's talk about it. Let's start with what kind of God? You know, there was a university professor uh, who happened to be a Christian. And so from time to time, uh, students would come up to him and they would, they would say, you know what, I don't believe in God. And he would gesture for them to sit down and he says, you know what, sit down. Tell me about this God that you don't believe in because I probably don't believe in him either. See, whether or not you believe in the existence of God, each of us has an idea in our mind of what God is like. The only question is, is it a good picture? Is your God fair or cruel? Loving or petty? Personal or indifferent? What kind of God is he? See, these are important questions because what you believe about God really affects whether or not you believe in God at all. See, many skeptics aren't closed off to the idea of God's existence. So they're just closed off to what they know about him or what they think that they know about him. And so then the question, what kind of God would demand such a horrific and unimaginable thing as God demanded of Abraham? It's not an easy question to answer. But if you don't believe in a sadistic or cruel God who delights in suffering, we're on the same page. Right off the start, we're, we're, left, we're led into a key piece of information that Abraham doesn't get. And that's that this is a test. That God is testing Abraham. Not from the beginning is he intending for Abraham to kill his son at all. Right from the start, God has provided a ram in the thicket. But Abraham doesn't know that. But still though, even, even if this was just a, a test, why go through with it? See, because God knows everything. He knew how Abraham would respond. How, how, was this somehow for his benefit or was there something else going on here? See, would Abraham, the, the question was, would Abraham let go of everything that he had held on to and strive for for years and years, hearing about the promise, believing in the promise, structuring his life after the promise, when he finally had the prom, promise living and breathing in front of him and God said, no, now give it away, what would he do? See, it was, he was forced to choose between the promise of God and the God of the promise. 
between his life's ambition, between his dreams, between what he aspired to be, and costly obedience. It's clear that Abraham's unconditional faith is honored by God. When Abraham faces the death of his son and emerges on the other side, it's only through faith. It is then and only then that God promises for the seventh time that he will see to it that every promise he has made will come to pass. Biblically, the the number seven represents wholeness or completion. So it's a very powerful moment when God comes to Abraham and he says, look, I'll make sure that what I promised you happens. Now here's another puzzling thing. In James chapter 113, we're told, and remember, when you're being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. And so we know that God doesn't tempt us. We know that God's not going to tell us to sacrifice our children. We know that God is not ever going to ask you to do something evil. And so we have to ask ourselves, why the exception with Abraham? Well, to find a clarity to that answer, we need to look at the other two parties involved. We need to ask ourselves, what kind of father? You know, from the the gut-wrenching pain and panic and a little bit of lingering guilt for not, you know, being on top of my son before he, he went down that hill, I cannot fathom the kind of resolve that Abraham had. I cannot fathom the kind of pain, the kind of hurt, the kind of inner turmoil he must have felt. You see, even though a a word is hardly spoken by Abraham, the emotional struggle just drips off the pages as it goes just slowly, uh, one by one, through the different things that Abraham does. He gets up early in the morning. I bet he did. I wonder if he slept at all that night. He gets up early in the morning. He loads the donkey, he gathers the servants, he chops the wood. It slowly, painfully, mechanically goes through each and everything that he needs to do. In verse 4 it says, on the third day of their journey, their journey took three days. Abraham had to sit with this for three days. The internal wrestling match that that must have have been all-consuming. At any point, he could have turned back. At any moment, he could have decided, you know what, I'm going to try to fulfill God's promises my way. Right? I'm going to turn back and I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to pick the easy route. But he kept the course. And when they finally, they they reach their their destination, Abraham and Isaac head off alone to the, the sacrificial site. And it's here, it's only here that we're given the first little clue into the mindset, into into the inner thought life of Abraham. He says to his servants, he says, stay here. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there, and then we will come right back. We will come right back. Now, you you might be tempted to think, you know, that's just empty words. But Hebrews 11.9, we're given the, the privilege of hindsight, sheds some light on Abraham's faith. It says, Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. Right? Isaac was as good as dead to Abraham for three days. He dealt with that suffering, with that pain, knowing that it was going to happen for three days. Abraham resolved that God would provide one way or another. And by the way, that word provide... Um, to the te- in the text is, is equivalent to our modern day, we'll see to it. Make sure it happens. It's a sure thing. And so when Abraham says that God will provide, he means that he's going to take care of it. And sure enough, just as Abraham lifts the knife to slay his son, God miraculously intervenes and provides a ram as a substitute. You know, how do you, have you ever read this story and thought, man, how do you get to this level of faith? How do you get to this this place where you just, you're not holding on to anything? And you're just saying, God, I believe so much in your character. I believe so much in your goodness. I believe so much in your mercy. I believe so much in your grace that I'm just not going to hold on to anything. How do you get there? How do you as a father say, okay, I guess it's time to sacrifice my son now? 
And it's, it, it's interesting to note that in the ancient Near Eastern um, times that this was, was happening, child sacrifice was a fairly common thing. But to Abraham, this was more than that. This was his son, his only son. It's stressed over and over again in the text. This was the one that he loved. This wasn't uh, the, the son through another person, a son by adoption. This was his son. And supernaturally, over and over again, God had provided a way for the son to be born. And now standing before him, he knew that faith was the only way forward. He trusted in the character of God more than life itself. You know, speaking of life, it wasn't Abraham's life who was on the line, was it? You know, we often call this the test of Abraham, but in many ways this is also the test of Isaac. You know, what kind of son follows his father obediently to death? Scholars figured that at this point, Isaac was a young man. This isn't just shortly after he was born. He was a young man, and you have to remember that Abraham at this point was like 100 years old or older. Right? So we're, we're, talking, we're talking he could easily overpower his father at any given point. You know, he could have, he could, he could have pushed his dad to the ground and H-E double hockey stick his way out of there. But he didn't. Isaac himself carried the wood for the sacrifice on his shoulders. Not once, but twice the text mentions that they walked together. Side by side in unity. Father and son. When Isaac asks about the apparent lack of a sacrifice, like, come on guys, he knew. He knew that something was up. His dad had probably been acting a little weird the last three days. They're going to present a sacrifice, and he's like, hey, uh, so I noticed that there's no sheep here. What's that story? And I'm carrying the wood, and you've got a knife, and you've got fire. Um, what's happening here? He knew. He allowed his father to bind him, and he laid down willingly on the altar. He trusted his father. He was obedient even to the point of death. So let's pause here for a second. Let's get this straight and, and clear in our minds. We have a God who will stop at nothing to keep his promise. A father who is willing to kill his son in faith, that he'll be raised again. And we have a son who is willing to sacrifice himself out of obedience to his father. What do we make out of all of this? To ancient Israel, this was the pinnacle moment of faith. This was the kind of faith that Yahweh demanded from Israel. It was a reminder of His provision. It was a reminder of His protection that despite the constant uh, conflict in the Middle East between all of their wars, between all of their struggles, between all of their sinning and all of these different things, that God would see to it that His promise would not fail. And it was here on, on Mount Moriah that Solomon's temple would later be built as a reminder of that promise. But the true and better story is realized in Jesus. See, this isn't about Abraham. This isn't about Isaac. It's about Jesus. Because Jesus is the true and better Isaac. Just as Isaac carried the wood on his shoulders and ascended that hill, so too did Jesus, laden with that wooden cross, ascend the hill of the skull in the same area to die for our sins. Just as Isaac was obedient to his father to the point of death, so too was Jesus obedient to our heavenly father. Just as Isaac was metaphorically raised to life again, Jesus was raised to life after three days. Just as God provided the lamb as a substitute for Isaac, did Jesus taste death as a substitute for us. But God did not send his son alone. See, just as Abraham gave his son, his only son whom he loved, so did our heavenly father. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him would have eternal life. 
Just as Abraham went up with Isaac, the father and son are one. Just as Abraham grieved, so much did our, more did our heavenly father when he saw Jesus on the cross. In the same way that Abraham overcame the greatest test through faith, it's only through faith in Christ that we can attack and overcome the greatest obstacle in human existence, death itself. And in both, we see a God who will stop at nothing to see that every promise comes to pass. In this gut-wrenching drama, we see the cross in a clarity that our logic, that our reason can't comprehend. Right? We see, we see a father who lost his son. The son who sacrificed himself. The God who provided a way to restore us back into a relationship with himself. He himself carried the punishment for our sins. He himself bore them. He himself provided. And this... This, friends, is why I stand here week after week, Sunday after Sunday, saying faith is the way forward. See, the real question that has left us is what kind of God, what kind of father, what kind of son would do that for me? This is the true and better story. Seems like everywhere we look, someone is giving us a narrative of how we should live our lives, where to find happiness, where, where true joy is, where meaning is, where significance is, where we can find peace. But they're counterfeits that fall helplessly short. And it's only in Jesus that we find the true and better story that we can live by. He's not promised us a life of comfort or affluence or wealth or power, and he never intended to. He promises a way to see the world clearly for the first time with the confidence of things unseen through the lens of faith. And so it's left to us to respond this morning. Jesus gave it all. He, there was nothing that he held on to. He gave it all for you because he loves you. He held nothing back. So what's stopping you from receiving his love? What are you holding on to? Because to have a relationship with Jesus requires a different kind of death. Not our physical death, but a death to our will, a death to our sin, a death to our way of living life. But if we die with him, then we live with him. We experience the true and better way. We experience what it means to truly live. It is only in dying that we may truly live. If you're looking for a better story, there isn't one. Faith is the way forward. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're just in awe of all that you've done for us. That you would stop at nothing, nothing, have a relationship with us. That on the cross, you not only experienced the pain of, of death, you experienced the pain of a son, of a father, of a God whose, whose heart breaks for humanity. And you did that so we could have life abundantly with you. Praise you for that in Jesus' mighty name. I want to invite you to respond this morning. I'm going to ask the prayer team to come on up. If you've been coming to Bethel for a while, you know that uh, we've, we've had a prayer team in the past and we've got one going again. There's going to be two, uh, two, two teams at the back and, and I'll be up here with someone else at the front. And the band's just going to play a song and we're just going to have a time of prayer. And you can come with whatever burden you're carrying whatever problem you have, maybe something that, that I said, maybe the Holy Spirit was, was speaking through me and it has really convicted your heart and you just want to pray with someone, you want to talk to someone, these people are safe. But would you respond? Coming forward, sitting down, standing and singing. Don't waste this moment. Work.
creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry then from north to south and east to west we hear Christ be magnified and were the whole earth echoing his imminence his name would burst from sea and sky from rivers to the mountains and tops we hear Christ be magnified Oh, Christ be magnified Let His praise arise Christ be magnified in me Oh, Christ be magnified
just as they're continuing to pray, you're welcome to stay and linger in this moment. You can see there's still some prayer ministry going on. I would encourage you to do so. Uh, if you've got to go, that's okay. You can you can duck out. But I'll just ask as you're, you know, as a pastor, if you can hang on for another five minutes, that'd be awesome. Maybe you could lead us in another song, Pastor Real. Your plans for me are good And I know you hold my future in my hope Your promises never fail Your promises never fail And I know your thoughts, your plans for me are good And I know you hold my future in my hope promises never fail, your promises never fail, and I'm standing on every promise that you good news his promises will never fail awesome awesome God is good well bless you be blessed I hope you've been blessed this morning but don't just you know keep that blessing to yourself go out and bless somebody else uh, a very practical way you could be a blessing right now if you could help move some chairs to the front so we can set up a bouncy castle in here that'd be great